Hey, good Tuesday morning, everybody. Welcome to the VolQuest podcast. I am Eric Kane alongside Rob Lewis and Brent Hubs. As always, a big thank you to our friends over at Exterior Home Solutions for bringing the, being the presenting sponsor of this show. They've been local and trusted since 1999. If you have a need for uh, siding, windows, roofing, you can contact Exterior Home Solutions today, especially with these summer storms going on right now. They can help you out. That phone number is 865 524 5888 or online at exteriorhomesolutions.com. Uh, a lot going on right now. Might not feel like it because, you know, if you're a Tennessee fan, you're blessed because the offseason has really shrunk because of how good, you know, Tennessee basketball and Tennessee baseball has been here lately. Uh, but we're in the summer months or the summer month of July, Brent, and recruiting. We've got a couple of guys who have made commitment announcements in terms of when they're going to announce David Sanders in August. Uh, Tennessee was crystal ball. Their Tennessee was RPM, I should say, for a highly touted linebacker earlier this week. A lot going on in terms of recruiting. Football camp coming up in a matter of weeks, and uh, a lot of baseball transfer portal notes right now, all at BallQuest.com. Yeah, there's a ton of things happening right now, obviously, and um, you know it feels like it's the dog days of summer, but there are no dog days of summer anymore when you when you look at what's going on in the world of college athletics. Uh, it's always happening. Recruiting, as you mentioned, um, baseball portal talk. There's so much going on there as well. Basketball's got their summer stuff. I mean, basketball is year round now. Used to you had, there. I mean, if you did midnight madness in basketball, now you do it like on June first. If you did a true midnight madness, because it's a true year round deal anymore. So uh, it, it's a great time to check us out. Lots of stuff going on. Lots of stuff to talk about. And obviously, all eyes are on football camp, which opens up on Ju- July 31st. Yeah, and um, with with football camp opening up on July 31st, I thought we'd go back and kind of reset some topics that maybe we left off from spring practice. Um, Second-year breakout players, maybe not a James Pierce and what he did last year, but who were some of those guys that we'd expect to take big-time leaps in their second year? That's coming up later on the show. But I want to start off with position battles. Uh, a couple key ones come to mind, Rob Lewis. First and foremost, the biggest one, I believe, is left guard. Tennessee, when you look across the offensive line, they, you know who your left tackle is going to be. You know who your center is going to be. Your right guard, if healthy, your right tackle. You know who the swing man is going to be. You know who some of those depth options are. But the left guard position is very much unsettled. It was unsettled in the spring ball. Never thought a starter would come out of spring ball. But entering fall camp in a couple of weeks, that's going to be one of the biggest storylines is who is going to be the left guard for Tennessee. Yeah, and you know, before we kind of dive into it, I just want to say, you know, in in looking in the rearview mirror of where we have all been in the past, you know, five or six years. I was just thinking talking, that too. Yeah, talking about when you're worried, you know, one of the biggest things you're worried about in Tennessee football is who's going to be the starter at left guard. I mean, things they, things have, have have turned around in a pretty mm-hmm. significant manner, without question. But you know, I just you're. You're not going to have a horrible answer there. I mean, you know, you're not you're not going to you know roll out a guy there that's that's you know had got two dozen starts under his belt. But I mean, you got some dudes there that that have played. I mean, Carrick Carrick's been around. Um, you know, Lampley, if you, if you have to go there, has been in your program forever. I mean, it's just not a you know total cupboard is bare situation like we've seen in in, in some p- position battles. You know, at, at lots of different spots in, in the past is kind of my biggest takeaway. I mean, it's this. You, you're probably it might not be a perfect situation, but it, you're going to end up with some dude there that you know is has been around the block. I mean, I think it's going to be interesting, Eric, when you when you look at that. First of all, I mean, it's probably I mean it's the biggest battle on the offensive side of the ball. Um, I don't think it's the biggest question on the offensive side of the ball when, when you look at this team. I think you can make a case for what are they what are they at tight end is a bigger unknown than finding an answer at left guard for, for, for the exact reason Rob's saying, uh, I, I think, I think there's a real chance Jackson Lampley starts the season at, at left guard. I think that, I think Jackson Lampley played his best football at the end of last year, uh, bowl game, um, end of the regular season. Uh, I think he's got more confidence than he's ever had because he's got some experience and some quality snaps under his belt and some, not mop up duty stuff, like some real situational football stuff. Uh, but you know, where's Sham Yumeroff? I mean, the, the thing is, you have bodies there that you you think, all right, look, we we got a we got a pretty good left tackle beside him. We got a veteran center. We can help that guy out if we need to help him out with a young player, or we can go with a veteran like like Jackson Lampley, who 
knows that offense inside and out. Jackson Lampley could actually help your left tackle probably if he had questions. So um, I don't think they have – I don't think they have bad answers there. I think Rob's right. I mean, I, I think that – do they have an all-pro answer there, an all-conference player there? No, I don't think they do at this point. But I don't think that that's one of those things where you're like, oh, my gosh, I don't, I don't know where they find a guy from because I think they can go – and a variety of different directions there with, with that position, which is um, not a bad thing. And, and again, I think when they've had offensive line questions, Glenn Ellerby's found answers. Schematically, he's found answers, you know, and and, and in you know personnel wise, he's found answers. I, I think that's that's been a strength of his since his arrival at Tennessee. You look at the we we've mentioned these names here. The four guys are kind of in contention there. Sham might have the highest you know ceiling, um, if you will. Uh, down the line, but is he ready to go right now? You know, we'll we'll see if fall camp uh, can give us some answers there. Jackson Lampley, again, as you mentioned, veteran playing his best football at the end of last year. You have Andre Carrick, who missed most of last year with injury. Um, started the first couple of games left guard, and we know that the offensive line coach likes what he sees in Andre Carrick. So, again, at least an experienced guy. And then you have a guy in Dane Davis, which Brent, tell me if you disagree. I don't think Tennessee would prefer him to be the left guard, but is a guy that played left guard the entire spring because, I mean, they were down some guys. Jackson Lampley was playing right guard and, and Davis was playing left guard. Um, he can certainly do it. He can play it in a pinch. He can do a spot start there if needed. But it feels like Dane Davis is – they want him to be the swing man, to be back up both tackles, kind of come in there and, and get some playing time probably each game somewhere, kind of to be that sixth man that's just you know, really, really versatile and vital in this offense for Glenn Ellerby. Well, he is, but I mean, I think that they're, they feel a little better about where they are at tackle than they did going into spring when, um, you know, and this is a byproduct of the fact that Dane Davis was working at left guard so much in spring. It forced Jesse Perry, it forced Larry Johnson into action, into quality snaps and scrimmage settings. And all of a sudden now, you know, instead of Larry Johnson going against a young defensive end, he's going against James Pierce every day. You know, and that, that only makes you better. And so I think they came out of spring for the 24 season a little better shape in terms of some depth at the tackle spot that, you know, you, you kind of got a hodgepodge of bodies there, which probably frees Davis up a little bit more uh, if need be. But, I mean, here's the one thing that we've seen out of Glenn Ellerby and Josh Heibel. They're not afraid to move guys, you know, and, and play them at different spots in a game particularly those veteran guys, right? I mean, we, we saw it last year. I mean, Ollie Lane played center. He played guard in the same game. You know, Dane Davis played guard. He played tackle in the same game. Um, so they're, they're not afraid with those guys who have that versatility and the ability to play multiple spots. It doesn't bother them to play in multiple spots during the game. So could Davis start at guard? And then if you had an injury and he had to bump out at tackle, you went with another guard? Sure. I, I don't think that would bother them in the least because they'll – uh, Dane Davis will get enough reps at guard and at tackle and probably some center reps too in fall camp to where he's in a position that you can play him wherever you need to, to, to play him, whether he's starting or whether he's in a rotation or whether he's just a backup at that position. Yeah, real quick, we still do believe that he'll open up the se the season probably as the backup center, at least to begin the first couple of games. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I mean, I think that makes the most sense. You know, we'll, we'll see where they are. Um, you know, where, where are these young guys, um, these freshmen that arrived, you know, who can play, who can play center there? You know, where, what kind of summer has Vice and Lang had? I mean, this is, this summer's on Vice and Lang. Okay. I mean, this is like, you know, the, the opportunity has never been greater for you than it is right now. Because you got a veteran in Cooper Mays. Let's, let's face it, Rob Lewis. How many snaps does that guy need in fall camp? Right. I mean, you know, not knock the knock the rust off a little bit in a scrimmage here and there for a few snaps and, and get him out of the way. The last thing you want is somebody falling on him or rolling him up. So well, and, and after uh, last August, especially, I mean, you know, after the way that worked, after and after you jinxed him by talk, by saying you should have wrapped him in bubble wrap. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I jinxed him. I think I spoke the just truth. Kidding, but I know. Um, but I'm but, but I'm with you about you wonder, Hubbard, uh, how much. But how much of that, so much of that is on maturity as a young kid because you're right the opportunity is immense but the real opportunity for him is next year but if he has a great summer a great august i mean he's positioned himself to you know just walk into january as the starter for this team in 2025 at center and you just wonder how many kids can take that long view because it's i mean it's there for the taking for him to put himself 
in you know in the driver's seat to, to take over and be a three year starter. Well, and here's the other thing too. I mean, I, I, do you after seeing him for a couple of years now, do you think he can be your center? Because the center position for Tennessee is hard. Okay, I mean, I mean, there's a lot going on at that center spot mentally, physically, you know. And and if you don't think he's a center, you're not sure. He could he could certainly insert himself into the guard competition if he's done what he needs to do this summer. And that's some weight management. That's the effort that he needs to do, you know, and, and all those things. I, I think the commitment level um, to doing all the little things is something where Vice and Lang probably has to has to show himself, you know. Um, and, and then what freshman do you look at, you know, at that at that center spot? Is Satterwhite going to be a guy that's going to be in there? Um, you know, I mean, what, what other guys in that, in that spot can Max Anderson be your center in there? Probably not at, at, at his size and his height, but what do you look like at that center spot, um, behind, you know, Cooper Mays? I think that's a, that's a thing you're looking for this fall. I mean, we've all assumed it's Bison Lang, but it might not be Bison Lang. There might be somebody else that has to emerge there as a young player. And again, this staff really high on this freshman class that arrived and went through spring practice, not just Jesse Perry and Gage Ginther. I mean, they like what they see and uh, Max and then Satterwhite and those guys. I mean, they, they feel like they've got some quality dudes there. It's just a matter about figuring out what position all those guys are going to be playing. Um, doesn't mean any of them are ready to play now, Eric, but but I think there's some some feeling that they've, they've got that's going to give them some depth uh, in time, and that's going to give them some guys they can build on in 25 when obviously that offensive line is going to look very, very different. Yeah, and then you throw in Bennett Warren, who's you know got here in the summer, and he'll be playing catch up, obviously. But uh, he was the highest rated you know offensive lineman of of that class for Tennessee. So well, and you know, nobody's really talked about him. I mean, it's all been about how big Jemias Hurd is, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, what does Hurd look like? And he's going to play tackle. So you've got some bodies there. I think you're unproven. Um, but, and we'll see where some guys are. But in terms of position battles now, you got to find a left guard. And then I, I think you have to have Dane Davis ready as your backup center because of his knowledge of the offense right now. Well, let's stay on the offensive side of the football. Brent brought this up a moment ago. And, you know, for the first time really since the first year when there was just so many unknowns, you know, when Josh Heupel took over, you, you don't know what you have at tight end. Jacob Warren – is gone. He's no longer teaching a master class on the position here in this offense. Prince of fans gone. McCallum Castles came in, did a great job last year. He was one and done. He's gone. You have Ethan Davis, who from an athletic standpoint and versatility and all that you love and uh, you're learning how to play hand in the dirt inline stuff over the last couple of years. That red shirt year was big for him. Um, you, you like what you have there. You bring in Holden stays from Notre Dame. He was the number one target. I mean, you had to have a tight end. That's what Tennessee made the priority in December. They went out and got one. And then an afterthought was Miles Kitzelman, who didn't have much of a role at Alabama, but came in in the spring, had a really, really good spring. They've always said they want to have three tight ends that they play. They've, they've only ever played two over the course of the three seasons here. But I think the biggest question is, is kind of, you know, what do you have at that position? And, and Rob, we know, we know how critical that position is for this offense. You've got to have somebody that's durable. You've got to have two that can play because they split it 50-50 in terms of snaps. And you gotta have a guy that can go, and uh, I'm intrigued to see what Holden stays and, and Ethan Davis specifically uh, can do this spring and obviously or this fall uh, into the football games. I think it's fascinating because you know on the on the one hand we we all or I, I think we all think Ethan Davis is is a real talent. I mean, just tantalizing, but at the same time, I mean, he's you know just done done nothing. You know, injuries. And, you know, he played wide receiver or played split out wide in high school, but you know. It, if you, if you walk out on the practice field, you know, and just start swiveling your head around, he's one of the guys that, that pretty much will consistently jump out at you. Can he, you know, can he be a two way factor? I mean, the way you know, physically, golly, Hubbard, he's, he's probably pretty similar to, to Jacob, you know, right now. And when you just talk about dimensions, what he's six, five, two, two thirty five, two forty, And I think Jake, Jacob finished stronger than that, I guess, but I mean, he played at that, at those, at that weight and was, was effective. And you know, I think Ethan's probably more athletic than oh, yeah. him, but but I, I think it's you know, I, th I I think that's a guy that I one of the guys I'm most interested in just because of that position. And you know, they've not had a guy like him in this offense. I mean, what can Hypel do with with a dude like that at that position in this offense? And what does it open up? What does it look like? I mean, I'm I'm really interested to, to see that. 
And you hope yeah, he stays I, healthy. Uh, again, yeah, he's absolutely. had a couple injuries here at Tennessee, and and you hate that. Um, but also, you know, football's contact sport. But you're you're playing tight end. Not only are you splitting out wide sometimes, like you did in high school. I mean, you've got your hand in the t- the dirt, and you're playing H back, and and you're lead blocking sometimes in those split zones. I mean, you're you're gonna you're gonna be right in there. And uh, you know, more than anything, you hope he stays healthy because, as Rob mentioned, from an athletic standpoint, he he's fun to watch, and, and I think he could be good in this offense for sure. Well, I don't think there's any doubt that, you know, athletically he can do a ton of things. You'd love him out off the line, you yeah. know, uh, you know, in the, you know, but when he's, when he's in line, what does he look like? How physical is he there? That's always been his challenge. And can he stay healthy? Talent wise, it's not a question uh, to, to me. I, I think, I think Ketzelman is the guy that nobody talks about that. I think everybody's going to see, you know, 87 out there for a whole bunch of snaps, because here's, here's the thing about Miles Ketzelman. I don't know how great of a receiver he is because he's never had the opportunity. He did he did more, you know, he was productive offensively, you know, from a pass catching standpoint in spring. He did some nice things. But here's what we know about Miles Ketzelman. He has blocked in this league. And no offense to Holden Stays and no offense to Notre Dame. I know they play I know they play good teams and he's he's Holden Stays had to block some quality defensive ends. But each and every week in this league, you're blocking dudes off the edge. And Ketzelman knows how to block in this league. And I think there's value in there that's probably not discussed a lot when talking about Ketzelman. It probably was thought, you know, uh, here's an afterthought depth piece. But you go back and look, yeah, he didn't catch a ball. But how many reps does he have as a blocking guy? And, and how valuable is that in this offense? How important is that in this offense? In some ways, I think it's easier to unlock his athleticism as a pass catcher than it is to take an athletic guy and try to make him a finishing blocker. And, and I think Ketzelman has got the finishing blocker part further along than the other two, uh, which is a big piece to this puzzle for Tennessee. Now, will they play two, you know, a bunch of two tight end sets, or do they feel like, you know what, we got to make sure we stay healthy there and we kind of do what we've been doing and basically play one tight end and rotate those guys? I think that'll be intriguing to watch um, because, I mean, your freshman help's not going to be a factor um, physically at this point. So it's really those three guys. And then I guess Charlie Browder as a walk on, you know, but, but it feels like it's really those three guys. And do you play two of them at the same time or do you just rotate out of those three guys? That'll be inter- intriguing and interesting to watch to see what Josh Heupel and Joey Halsley do in building this offense out this fall. Yeah, you play one tight end, of course, when you get on the, uh, you know, in the, in the red zone there within the 10, five yard line. Sometimes you throw three out there at one time. And, you do. And uh, Tennessee's found success in doing that. Um, got hey, some. You see, I will just, before we move on, I just want, I know there'll be a bunch of inside baseball guys on the side. Hover, give, where's Emmanuel Okoye in, in that? I know, I know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I mean, some people want to know. I'm not, I mean, I'm, yeah. I don't think right. he's going to play, Defensive but I mean, line, some people, yeah. Yeah, he's 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 on he's in Rodney. He's in Camp Garner. Yeah. So I mean, point. what I mean, what do you feel like? I mean, what do you feel like? You know, precipitated that that move? I, just, I, was it the block? Was it the physical aspect, or that you know, just the the natural pass catching thing that he couldn't? I think I think it was the how can we allow him to be the most athletic he can be, and and, and I go back to I've said this a million times, and 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 I'll say it again. He, he is so raw in terms of football knowledge mm-hmm. that I, I think that position to tight end, you got to know receiver, you got to know offensive line blocking scheme. You got to know run game scheme in terms of where the back's going. Sometimes you may emotion at age rate. There's a whole lot to dive, <clears throat> dive into. That's a hard position for someone to play who played football in Europe on soccer fields that had no hash marks, had no lines. I mean, it, he was playing backyard football is what he was doing. And so I think to allow him to be the most athletic and to keep him the most engaged, I, I think let's give him a shot in spring to see what he can do at defensive end. And I think coming out of that, they're like, you know what? Not now, but he has a he has much more of an upside as a defensive end than he ever will at tight end because of his lack of football knowledge. It's not his fault, but but I think that that's where it's at. You know, I mean, I go back to when Chris Ock Perogaday was a senior in high school and interviewing him, and he talked about 
you know, the first year he played, he didn't understand that, that there were four downs. Like he just did what somebody told. I mean, he just didn't know the game. And I'm not, I'm not making fun of him. No, I've, guy, I've, the, I've, the I've never talking to the same the, kid, same you know, thing. The, yeah. The, the guy didn't grow up playing football. He didn't grow up I mean, watching football. We don't, we don't ever think TV. about it. I mean, it's 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 second nature to all of us. I mean, growing up like we did, but I mean, you know, they do penalties. You know, yeah. <laughs> first down, Yard markers, cuts, first down. Kickoff. I mean, it's, it's, Jackson it's Ross didn't know what a what a flag was. I mean, yeah, it's just it's. So don't grow up with it. You don't know. I, th- I thought I thought I think Emmanuel's a great story. I just thought I thought it was always odd they started him there just because of all the things you're saying, Hubber. It's not a place where you could just. You know, on th- at, the, at the very least, on third down, you can think of the defensive end, say, line up and go. Yeah, you know? well, I think I think start him there just to see because you had you had plenty of depth at the defensive end position, and yeah, I think that's you true. got that's true. I think you got into his first spring practice, and you're kind of like, you know what, Th- this guy's still swimming and trying to figure out how to play the game. Let's see what he can do on the other side, and I think he's got some some twitch about him, and we'll see what he grows into and, and develops into, but. I just think after trying at, at the tight end position, it's just probably too much for him to, yeah, to try to master in a short period of time. We'll continue the conversation about position battles entering fall camp. Tennessee begins fall camp July 31st, so just a couple of weeks away, and the football pads are coming back on. Of course, we'll be over there every single day bringing you coverage right here at VolQuest.com. So uh, some more position battles on the defense side of the football. Do want to ask one more about offense. Uh, But first, I want to tell you about our friends over at Factor Meals. Warmer, sunnier days. They're not just calling. They're happening right now. And you can fuel up for those sunny days and those hot days at Factor's. No prep, no mess meals. Uh, Meet your wellness goals in time for summer thanks to the menu of chef-crafted meals with options like Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Factory's fresh, never frozen meals are dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes or so. No matter how busy you are, you'll always find time to enjoy nutritious, great tasting meals. Um, I've had a couple of factor meals, you know, over the course of the year delivered to my house, literally two minutes. They're good. They're, they're, they're healthy for you. Um, it, it, it doesn't take any time at all. And I couldn't recommend factor meals any more than, than I am right now. It's, it's, it's some good stuff. And I encourage you guys to check it out as well. 35 different meals. More than 60 add-ons to choose from as well every single week. You'll always have new flavors to explore. You can crush your wellness goals this summer. Dietitian-approved meals, ingredients that you can trust. Um, breakfast, dessert, you can stay fueled. Easy, nutritious options all then and more. So how do you do it? Well, go to factormeals.com slash VQ50, VQ50, and you're going to use that promo code VQ50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. So let me run through that again. That is factormeals.com slash VQ50. Promo code VQ50 for 50% off your first box, 20% off your next month. Promo code VQ50 at factormeals.com slash VQ50 and uh, go ahead and crush those wellness goals and have a nice meal in less than two minutes, never frozen meal, by using Factor Meals. So big thank you to them. And as always, a big time thank you to our friends and our proud presenting sponsor of the VolQuest Podcast. That is Exterior Home Solutions. Severe weather can strike at any time in East Tennessee. And Mother Nature can do severe damage to the first and most important line of defense that you and your family have against Mother Nature. And that is your roof. Whenever she strikes, make sure that you call the people that I call. Make sure you trust the people that I trust. And that's my friends at Exterior Home Solutions because they're more than friends, they're truly family. Big time thank you to our friends over at Exterior Home Solution. Again, that phone number is 865-524-5888. You can visit them online at exteriorhomesolution.com. Uh, talking position battles entering fall camp, Tennessee fall practice. Fall camp practice begins on July 31st, so just a couple of weeks away. We've talked left guard. We've done a little tight end. We know about the running back situation, okay, with Cam Seldon, you know, rehabbing and progressing, and we know it's Dylan Sampson and, you know, Khalifa Keith, Deshaun Bishop. We'll see where Peyton Lewis is to begin his Tennessee career. But I do want to hit on wide receiver real quick before we go over to defense. When Brew McCoy is healthy, and, and, and Brent, you had a chance to catch up with him over the weekend, would love to – I uh, get your thoughts on Brew and what he said about that. But when Brew McCoy is healthy, he's wide receiver one. Okay. Squirrel wide your slot. My question for you guys is simply put right now, when all's healthy, who is that other outside guy? And will they truly play more than the three? I think if spring was any indication, you say, yeah, they're going to play more than three wide receivers. We know that's not always been the case. Brent Hubbs, 
Brew McCoy, and what you think about the receivers? Well, I, I thought Brew looked really good, uh, just standing around, walking around, and, and, and I thought he was leaner. Uh, I think he's lost some body fat. I think he's, uh, I think he's in a good spot. I think he's mentally in a good spot right now. Now, it's a whole different thing of mentally being in a good spot doing routes on air and even some one on ones and stuff in the summer versus shoulder pad helmets and running a running a post, right? Or running a crossing pattern in the middle of the field where the last time you did that, you know, you broke your ankle. So does he have a mental hurdle to get over? I don't think so, but you never know exactly what that's gonna look like. Um he just seemed like he was in a really good place and visiting with him physically. He made it very clear he's going through fall camp says he's got to get back out in the fire. He wants some contact and, and, and get going that way. But he's very confident with where he's at right now. Um, and, and so, I, yeah, I mean, he's going to play. He's going to play a bunch. I think the question you're asking, Eric, answers the first question you asked, and that is how many guys are they going to play? Because that's going to dictate a lot of what this looks like with Chris Brazel, with Mike Matthews, with um, – Dante Thornton and and then obviously you got Caleb Webb and you got Chaz Nimrod and uh, Rob I mean they, they have bodies there who have played meaningful snaps uh with the exception of Mike Matthews I mean I know Chris Brazel hasn't done it here but the guy was a thousand yard receiver at Tulane against quality competition Seven I mean, touchdowns. Top, they were a top 25 team last year I mean Chris Brazel is much more experienced than Dante Thornton was coming out of Oregon um, so they got a lot of bodies to work with. They got a lot of talent to work with. Um, I don't know that they have a position battle as much as they just have a heck of a fight on their hands, you know, w- within that group for the depth that they have. You better not have an off day. Or you better not take a day off. If, if, if I'm one of those guys, take me up and going, because if I sit on the sideline too much, somebody might take my spot. Yeah, I was going to say, Hubbard, I, to me, it's, it looks at least, you know, from here, like it's more of a battle for the you know pecking order as opposed to you know really you know, truly you know who's going to be a starter just how you know who's going to really cement themselves as a guy who's going to get regular play in time who's going to be in the game plan every week and i mean i that's going to be you know you got some some chat some contenders man i mean i think you pencil brew in you pencil squirrel in you know those guys are proven you know how what's the brazzle thornton thing to me is is really interesting i mean i think dante you know, everybody last year was just, you know, couldn't wait to see what he could do. And then it never really happened. He moves out wide and, 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 and you know, makes some, makes some things pop and you wonder. Had you a know, great spring. And, you know, so did the move out wide, did that, did that really click? I mean, is that you know, certainly that's kind of been a, a storyline. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think Brazel and Thornton, both, both of those guys look like they're going to help them to me. I mean, it's not going to be the most pivotal question on offense, but probably the most interesting note for me is just how much is Matthews going to play? How good is he really? You know, and that's, again, not not the most pivotal question for the fate of this football team this year, but it's, for me, I'm, I'm going to be interested. Does he really carve out some snaps? Because, I mean, this receiving core looks legit. If he plays as a freshman, that says a lot to me. You know, for me, Brent, it's, it's we always, we cover recruiting and we get excited and we have a five-star or a highly rated four-star and the coaches love this guy and I love the coaches, I love this program, speed, great fit in this offense, it's all great. You get into fall camp and, and they're a freshman and there's a learning curve there and that's awesome and, and you know, it, it's, it takes a little while. And so, like, th- this entire time when I've been projecting Mike Matthews, I'm like, okay, well, obviously I know he's going to be a stud, he's got the tools and everything, and he's, he's going to be really good, but is he really going to play as a freshman? I mean, is he really going to? Spring practice, every time they scrimmage, Brent, at least in the official scrimmage settings, he found the end zone. Dude just made plays, and and I, I, looks like he's going to play. As a true freshman, he deserves to play, you know, if all goes well in fall camp. Well, and again, that's what I'm saying. If you're, if you're one of those guys, you may not take a day off because – I mean, think about it. Think You talked earlier about how different this feels when we're discussing left guard as a position battle to, compared to where they were four or five years ago. Okay? I mean, think about Josh Heupel's first year here. We, we, I mean, we talk about, okay, he only played three receivers. That was out of necessity. I, I mean, you know, I mean, I think that that topic has evolved, evolved into, well, they just don't rotate. I don't know why that thumb keeps popping up there. Um, it's kind of strange. Um, but anyway, Robots are taking over. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there. Uh, but anyway, I mean, it became three receivers out of necessity, not necessarily out of wish. Um, you know, and, and then in obviously in 22, I mean, you weren't taking Jalen Hyatt off the field, right? And 
you probably didn't have enough bodies there. But I mean, the 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 the, the growth of that position group since not let's look at, let's take the first year out of the equation. Go back to twenty two, where they are numbers wise at that position group since twenty two to where they are now. It's vastly vastly different. I mean, it's just it's night and day different. So. I think it because of where they were their first two years, Rob, it became the narrative, well, they only played three receivers. But is that really what they want to do, or is it they played three receivers because they only trusted three receivers? And and that's where they are. I, I think they're gonna have more trust in this group and I think and, and they've got more talent to work with, which is why I think they will play more than three receivers on a regular basis, just because they're a lot different than they were those first two years where they just said, basically, this is the three guys we trust. Eat your Wheaties because you're going to play every snap. I mean, I think the jury's out, but I, mean, I, I think you're. I, I mean, I think I, I agree with what you're saying, but you know, they haven't had this kind of depth, and will they use it? I mean, I, I think you know, we we don't know. We think they will based off spring, but you know, that hasn't been the case yet, and they simply haven't had this many talented bodies to work with before. Well, and here's the other thing too. I wonder because of the numbers that they have, Eric. Do they feel like they can play Squirrel White as the punt returner? You know, did, would you have played him as your punt returner a year ago, given your lack of depth at the slot? If something had happened to D. Williams, that might have been a debate that you had, right? I mean, you've got to replace that position. That was such a dynamic weapon for this team. Is that Squirrel White? Is that Boo Carter? Who's that going to be? That's a position battle for um, whenever to, to discuss. But because of the depth there, does that give you the freedom to play? a guy like Squirrel White in the return game, which you probably weren't real comfortable doing a season ago, given your lack of depth at the slot position. Yeah, maybe so, because you know in that slot position, you have you know Braylon Staley, who had a great start to camp and was catching everybody's eyeballs, and Chaz Nimrod has played the slot. You know, when, when, when there was Squirrel White and nobody else last year, and Squirrel White was tired, Chaz Nimrod went in there and played the slot. So you have a couple of guys that you know can at least do it. And so I think that's a... A really good question. Well, and, and who else do they work in there? All right, mm -hmm. we, I mean, we talk about Staley, but I mean, could Matthews slide in there and play there? I mean, it could. Could Chris Brazel be a tall version of a guy in there? I mean, he runs routes kind of like a smaller guy because he grew so late. Could he end up being? I mean, that'll be a fun kind of. What is your best three combination, and where do they all fit? Or what is your best five? Or what is your second team best three look like? Who's where? That that'll be interesting to watch this spring. I mean, or this fall. It, it's a different type of question as opposed to a position battle, so to speak. It's more about who all fits in where and how much are you going to use all those guys. For a later day, we don't have the hit on it right now, but you brought up special teams, man. I mean, you know, Boo Carter got a lot of run there as, as a returner in spring, and, and excited to see what he can. I've seen him with the ball in his hands at the high school level. Obviously, it's pr pretty pretty dynamic. Um, Bayless Jones was such a weapon for Tennessee. D. Williams was in punt return, um, but D. Williams is not a good kick returner in terms of what Bayless was. And Bayless was not a kick returner when he, or Bayless was not a punt returner when he came here. He was always a kick returner. Anyway, he was dynamic in both respects. And um, hopefully Tennessee can get back to, to finding a guy that can really impact the game in terms of the kick returning as well. Um, let's go to a position battle. Let's go to safety. Okay. We, we think that Andre Tarantine is is a guy that's at least going to start at one of those spots. And you go and bring Jacoby Thomas in from MTSU. You've got John Slaughter. You have Will Brooks, who played both star and safety. Um, you got you got some names back there, Rob Lewis. What do you what do you think about the safety position entering camp and knowing that you know it can evolve over the course of the weeks leading into the season? I mean, I think that's one that we all have been looking, you know, pointing towards since you know last November. It did. I mean, and you knew you were going to have some, you know. So somebody's hand was going to be forced. And you're going to have some new blood um, back there. So, I mean, the transfer portal obviously is just e enormous, you know, you know, for Tennessee there. How quickly can those guys get acclimated? How quickly, you know, do they earn earn the trust? Um, you know, a, a star, I get, you know, Jordan Thomas, I don't want to, it's not fair to tag him with, you know, an injury tag, but, you know, he's, you know, he got to prove that he can stay healthy a little bit. Yeah, he does. But, um, you know, how just, you know, how quickly, did, did the transfers get acclimated and this turn time take advantage of the opportunity that is, you know, right there in front of him, had a nice bowl game. Um, you know, he's, he's really waited his turn. I think didn't play a lot as certainly not as much. I, probably the first year as he thought he was going to. 
tremendous opportunity. So again, you kind of like it at, 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 if you're talking about other places. I don't think there are horrible answers there. I mean, certainly not like you're talking about a few years ago. I mean, you're going to be able to turn to a guy at, at those spots, you know, that that has some experience, that has done some things, that has that has made plays in, in big spots. And again, you know, like we were talking earlier, not maybe not an all conference player, but you, you got some decent answers there. It looks like these days. And to me, it's a, it's about Will Brooks and Jacoby Thomas. Like, how, how is that going to shake out that battle? Uh, I think all of us assumed that was going to be Jacoby Thomas, and you know, Will Brooks just doesn't go away, and, and obviously has uh, the trust of Tim Banks. And we'll see where Jacoby Thomas is. Um, and, and, and listen, I mean, Turntine's got to go out and have a good fall camp. I'm not saying he's, you know, he, he's on easy street to opening day, but um, it feels like it feels like he's kind of there. And then you got you got a newcomer with a ton of experience in an old defense and a different defense in Jacoby Thomas, who's been highly productive. And then you got a guy that Tim Banks has got a lot of belief in, and, and has been a, he's been the biggest champion for Will Brooks. Okay, I mean, he has. I mean, Tim Banks has been the biggest cheerleader for, for Will Brooks. And I'm not saying Will Brooks has performed badly. I don't know everything they ask him to do. I think the perception of Will Brooks is, hey, he's a walk-on white safety, right? So he can't be the answer there. But he's a guy that Tim Banks obviously believes in. So um, maybe they rotate back there. You know, I, I mean, that, that, that would be – That would be that something. Would be some, that would be something to see. And I, I think that would help them. You know, I, I think that – and, and it's probably a little easier to do that this year because you don't have this great experience gap like you've had the last couple of years, right? I mean, you had you, you had Wesley Walker and you had Jalen McCullough who were old heads who had played so much football. And then there was a guy way behind them who was not very good and or, or not very experienced. And so what does that look like? Do they rotate more? I think it's going to be pretty interesting to see. Here's my question for you, Brent. We, we talk about it every single year. You know, it's kind of like everybody says we love to cross train. We got to be prepared. We got to cross train all this type of stuff. And we say, well, Tamari McDonald could slide back and play safety if need be. Or, you know, same situation here. Jordan Thomas, if healthy, say there's a situation where Boo Carter comes on and plays well. Jordan Thomas could be an option to slide back and play safety, at least be a depth piece back there because he was – a safety coming into college, obviously, and you know they put him at the star position. I think that's something potentially that you could maybe at least have as an option um, if if you're if you're down a few guys, or maybe down the line, maybe that's that 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 is the best option depending on Boo Boo Carter. But I think Jordan Thomas, his versatility, Boo Carter can play safety as well, and and some of these young guys, these corners can play safety too. Um, I'll be intrigued to see how much of the cross training dynamic they talk about and that that we at least see and the limited fall camp viewing experiences that we get. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, I think trying to cross-train cross -train Jordan Thomas last spring, not this past spring, but the spring before, probably stunted his development at star position. Yeah, They probably overloaded too much for him. Now, he's got experience now, um, and, and we'll see how much you do there. I mean, I think that it's a little bit like what we were talking about with, with Okoye, right? I mean, you, you, you don't want to limit a guy's athletic ability because you've got so much on his plate. And they asked that star guy to do a lot of things. And, you know, if Jordan Thomas is still settling in there, then um, I don't know how much you cross train with him right now. I think you make sure he's got that 100% because his backup is a very talented, very young Boo Carter um, who should play. They should put him in and rotate him and get him involved. And um, But is he ready to take over from day one? That I don't know the answer to. So I, I think you got to do everything to make sure Jordan Thomas is your answer at star. Uh, until you feel like Boo Carter is really ready. The last one I wanted to bring up here, and it's 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 kind of on a smaller scale. I mean, I'm not going to say, well, who's going to be the strong side defensive end because you know 13 guys are going to play on the defensive front. We know the rotations. We know what Leo is going to look like. We know the guys inside. We know the options on the outside. And and Tyree West, Tyree Weathersby, Dominic Bailey, um, Jason Jenkins, so on and so forth. Linebacker two, or the quote-unquote will position, if you will. Healthy Keenan Peely, he's going to be one of those inside backers. You got Jeremiah T. Lander, Aaron Carter. Not to the extent of the defensive line, but linebacker is a rotational position, Rob. So I don't think this is a huge deal. But one of the two, you would assume, and Caleb Perry's in that conversation as well, but one of the two of Jeremiah T. Lander and Aaron Carter, a rising sophomore, is going to be a starting linebacker opposite of of Keenan Peely on the inside. And and I do think the force-feeding mentality of those young backers at a necessity last year 
only going to help them moving forward. They've they've seen they've seen experience, they've gained experience, and um and and now it's time to see kind of how much you've improved from your from your true freshman season. Yeah, I, I could end up being wrong about this one, but I, that one doesn't worry me very much. Yeah. And I, I know neither one of those guys has a, has a big body of work. But again, maybe I'm being naive, or maybe I'm just you know being gullible. But I, I'm I'm high on both those kids. Um, you know, I think both of those guys flashed whenever they got a chance last year. Carter just flies. You know, T. Lander. I mean, any any. I mean, just the kid just earned more and more playing time as the year went on, and and he did more and more with it. So again, I I could be right, and I'm not saying they're going to be great out of the gate or anything. I just think both of those guys are going to be solid. SEC football players, and I, I would I would think both of them play. Yeah, I mean, you know, the question to me is going to be: Does William Inns rotate as much as as Brian Jean Marie did? And and I'm, we don't know the answer to that yet. We'll see. But I, I'm with again. I mean, we kind of beat this to, to death. I mean, we're, we're talking about what does linebackers three and four look like, or or maybe linebacker, you know, one li- starting linebacker spot. You're on, you're going to bracket with two really talented players. You know, which, again, I go back to there, there are years in this program where guys were given starting jobs the day they handed out uniforms. And, and that's not where this program's at. That's a credit to what I wrote about over the weekend. That's a credit to the roster management piece that, that Josh Heupel has employed in the culture he's created to keep guys here for development purposes, you know, let them develop. I mean, look, C- Caleb Perry, if he'd gone in the portal, would anybody really have blamed Caleb Perry for going in the portal? And I mean, he'd have found a home. He'd have found a home quick. Yeah, he'd have found a place to play. I mean, and there's no doubt about that. But he wanted to be here, and he wanted to be a part. I think that's the culture piece that's lost when we talk about the transfer portal, right? I mean, the transfer portal is free agency. Go gobble up starters. Go gobble this up. You got to keep some of your guys in in the fold. And Josh Heupel has done a really good job of keeping guys that they want to keep in the fold. Has it been perfect? Have they kept everybody? You, know, you can't sit here and say that, but they have kept, look, look at the, I mean, Rodney Gardner's going to play 13 guys on the defensive line. Who in the, who in the conference is going to play 13 defensive linemen? You know, I mean, Elijah sent, I mean, all those guys could have gone somewhere else if they wanted Jazz to. Jazz Nimrod, Caleb Webb. Yeah. I mean, there's just a bunch of those guys that elected to stay, which again, I think is a big part of the roster management piece that Josh Heupel has put together, um, that, that he and his staff have done a good job of keeping guys engaged, right? Letting them, getting them on the field, letting them play, making sure they understand the value of special teams and the value of the reps and not being afraid to play them in critical situations. I mean, think about, it. we're talking about Arian Carter. Arian Carter, I think it was the A&M game, which was a, what, 20 to 13 game? Arian Carter is covering a receiver in the end zone. On a, on a rail route. I mean, Arian Carter was playing in his eighth college football game. And he's playing in a critical situation. You go back to 22 in Baton Rouge. I mean, how many coaches tell a, a guy who's never returned a punt to go field the, field the first punt LSU kicks in, in Death Valley on the road? Hey, go field that punt. We trust you. I mean, th- they've given young people the opportunity, and those guys have kind of run with it. And as a result, a lot of those guys have stayed around and continued to be a part of the program, which is why the position battles we're talking about feel very different than they did years ago when they had no depth. Yeah, it, it is a huge difference entering the 2024 <laughs> season than it was entering the 2019, 2018. Um, and and we're, we're to the phase where we're, you're nitpicking now, but that's where you want to be, right? I mean, that's you want to be contending for college football playoffs, and in order to do that, your roster needs to be in a good spot. And uh, Josh Heupel would certainly say that he wants to improve as, as he should, but uh, this roster's certainly in a much better spot than what it was when he took over in a couple of years before that, that is for sure. Tennessee football training camp. Fall camp begins on July the 31st. It's going to be here in a matter of just a couple of weeks, and we'll have coverage for you every single day right here at VolQuest.com. We'll continue to preview some of the hotter topics entering fall camp. We'll have the mailbag portion of this podcast coming up on Thursday, so I go ahead and get those questions in as well. We couldn't do this show without our friends over at Exterior Home Solutions. 865-524-5888 is a 
phone number you can pick up and call for a free estimate if you have the need. And uh, that is ExteriorHomeSolutions.com. Local and trusted since 1999. A big thank you to Brent Hubbs, Rob Lewis, uh, for joining me, Eric Kane, here on this podcast. Thank you guys as always, and we'll see you again here on Thursday here on the VolQuest Podcast. <laughs>